I'd probably be looking for another job. They've been saying, well, we've got the uh, Forest Service on our side. We've got uh, you know, the revenues are speaking for themselves. We've got all this common sense and common knowledge. We're in a tree growing area. We're growing trees. We're doing a good job. And those companies and their workers are the ones that are most likely to be adversely affected. Every time I see a, another special on TV about the, the eradication of the tropical rainforests, and, and I mean, we here in the United States tend to look at these third world countries and say, oh, look what they're doing to their rainforests. It's just terrible. They're wiping out species right and left. And yet we have a very similar problem here, and we can't deal with it either. I don't have a bumper sticker on my car. Good evening. For 20 years, a war has been waged in the Pacific Northwest. It's been fought with words, court battles, and emotional appeals aimed at each one of us. It's meant to form our opinions on an issue that we may not fully understand. 20 years of listening and 20 years of debate, taking their toll and shaping opinions. Battle lines are drawn while deeply emotional forces are driving this conflict into our homes. State legislatures, federal courts, and Northwest Forests themselves have become the battlefields, our living rooms, the front lines. Tonight on Oregon Diary, we'll examine the spotted owl crisis try to clarify the issue, and discuss recent events leading to a larger debate on a national scale. This and more in the next hour. Stay with us. During tonight's program and in the weeks ahead, Oregon Diary will be featuring documentary work done by Oregon State University students in 1989. Each week we'll present one issue or topic relating to the people of Oregon. Tonight's feature is one of those works. It's titled, Fallen Trees, Broken Promises. Created by producers Robert Munez and Carlton Finley, this documentary examines the spotted owl controversy. Following our feature, I'll come back and update you on a compromise plan agreed upon in Congress in late September. Then I'll be joined by a guest who will discuss the viewpoints of the compromise. Now, Fallen Trees, Broken Promises. be better used to earn dollars than as home for a bird. The owl will live forever. We can't get enough logs to operate our mill. Our impact on the environment has been minimal. Job futures are bright in our state. If you watch their ads, you never think they cut a tree down. We've defused the biological time bomb. Our forests are disappearing. With such a vast resource, we're never going to run out. Reforestation has been an ineffective tool in adequate forest management. Our family's future is insecure. Oregon mills are not in jeopardy. We don't need to study anymore. We've researched enough. Our present security, our children's future, our relationship to nature, all sway upon a balanced compromise concerning an issue which few of us understand or until recently even cared about. In the next 30 minutes, together we'll explore Fallen Trees, Broken Promises. How do we know if we're meeting the balance between economic and environmental concerns? How can this balance affect the individual citizen of Oregon? What alternatives exist that could affect the future? Old growth forest is at the center of the controversy. What is old growth? Gary Miller researches spotted owls at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest near Blue River, Oregon. Lots of people have different definitions of, of old growth forest and some people base it strictly on it. That's, it's been one of the problems in defining uh, old growth 
and because there are so many definitions out there. There are three main features that can be found in any definition of old growth forest. Dead standing snags, a multi-layered canopy of trees, and fallen decayed logs. The large logs provide several things to the, to the system. Uh, they retain water. Uh, they provide uh, a substrate as they decay for other trees to uh, root in and, and grow from. They provide habitat for some of the forest floor small mammals that the owls prey on, such as the redback vole. Um, on the undersides of these large logs, you, it's where the redback voles have runways. Um, they may, because of their water retention, they may provide a, a good site for uh, fungi, which uh, some of the small mammals feed on. Standing snags are another part of the old growth forest. Uh, they provide uh, den sites for the flying squirrels, which is a prey of the owl. They provide uh, substrate for uh, the primary uh, cavity excavators, uh, such as the pileated woodpecker. Um, and with those cavities being created, provide habitat for uh, secondary cavity uh, users, some of the other owls, small owls nest in, in those snags. Uh, they provide a food source for, for other animals. It's not just old trees at all. I mean, it's dead trees, it's half alive trees, it's, it's clean water, it's water that comes down slowly, seeping down through the rotten wood, uh, being cleaned and given nutrient. Uh, it's the species that inhabit it, that area. As timber, old growth has both pluses and minuses. Since the trees have few branches, the wood has few knots. The large size of old growth makes it more efficient to log, since the same amount of wood can be harvested from one old growth tree as in several younger trees. However, in many areas, overmature timber, as loggers refer to old growth, is more of a problem than help. Often it is rotten, as the decay process has already begun, making it poor timber for harvest. And because of its size, it strains the limits of the logging machinery. Well, I personally don't like to, to have to log it. It's uh, usually they're, uh, they're rotten in this area. On the Sayus law, we, we log uh, mainly federal timber and uh, Bureau of Land Management timber. And the, the old growth in this area are not real desirable. They're usually bigger than uh, with the slack pulling carriages we're required to use small lines and uh, they don't really fit our machines all the time old growth forest is the last stage in the life of a forest another stage is the second growth forest made up of mature trees 70 to 140 years old which have regrown after harvest or natural disaster such as fire and this is the most valuable timber Third growth is made up of young trees that are not yet ready for cutting, less than 70 years old. Within the Sayusla National Forest, which is mostly second growth forest with some old growth stands mixed in, northern spotted owl habitat has been found. The initial uh, environmental analysis said that uh, they needed a thousand acres per pair in um, Unfortunately, the, the owl uh, likes prime habitat, uh, prime timberland for its habitat. And uh, somewhere between when they started identifying where these owls were at and uh, how many pairs there were, they decided that maybe they needed 2,000 acres per pair. So here again, we have that land allocation issue coming out, how much do they really need? And therein lies the controversy. But what is a spotted owl? The species that lives in this area, the subspecies, is the northern spotted owl, and it's basically found from uh, north of San Francisco up uh, and through the mountains of northern California, Oregon, and Washington from basically the coast over to the east flank of the Cascade Mountains and extends up into the southern portion of British Columbia. 
They nest in high decaying old growth trees. The owl does not build its own nest, but uses a nest, a cavity, or limbs that it finds. They tend to live in the same place from year to year and keep the same mate. The spotted owl, reproducing in unpredictable cycles, usually does not have young every year. It hunts rodents such as squirrels, voles, and rats. It attacks by sitting upon a perch and diving on its prey. Basically, it is a predator like other owls. But what makes it the center of the controversy? Basically because it, it's, it's uh, of, of all the species we've looked at that, uh, that occupy older forests, it has probably the most, the, the, a requirement for the largest amounts of old growth and mature forest. That is, they have very large home ranges and they utilize large areas of old forest. Um, uh, there are other species that, that show a preference for older forest, but none that seem to, to, to use as much uh, per pair or per individual as, as the spotted owl does. As a tool in managing the forest so that all of the creatures have a place to live, the Forest Service is using the owl as an indicator species. Well, the idea of an indicator, indicator species is that you have, uh, if you think you have a group of animals out there that require a certain kind of habitat. Um, the way it's been applied by most of the management agencies is that they, they, they pick the one species out of that group that they believe has the requirement for the largest amount of a given kind of habitat, okay? And they manage for that species, the idea being that the other species for which it's an indicator will be able to survive and prosper if you manage for just the one species. And the whole idea is not probably a particularly useful concept. There are lots of problems with it. Uh, and and it's, there, are, there have been lots of folks who have raised criticisms of the whole concept of an indicator species. It's, you know, it, was, it, it was an attempt to simplify things. Well, the owl is indicator species for the old growth habitat. The habitat we were talking about at the lower areas there, where there's a lot of diversity of, of species. Um, so by indicator species, we see that by the way the owl goes, so we believe the old growth forest is going. If the owl is disappearing, it must mean there's not enough of that habitat left. And indeed, there seems to be a close correlation. As we have cut over 85% of that habitat, we find that indeed the owl has lost a lot in population and seems to be approaching potential extinction. And now there's another, uh, another perspective, and that is that, that, that uh, Many people feel that the spotted owl was developed as an issue not for the merits of protecting the owl, but, but as what some people call a surrogate for the goal of protecting old growth forest for qualities other than as spotted owl habitat. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, there's certainly ample evidence that that agenda uh, has, uh, has occurred. It's a symbol of this whole conflict between the, the modern idea of intensive forest management for wood volume and, and, uh, and uh, species that perhaps don't adjust very well to that sort of, that sort of management. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's one small cog in this whole system out there uh, about which we really don't know very much. Research on the spotted owl has been going on for nearly 20 years. Dr. Forsman has been involved in the research since the beginning and presently directs the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's spotted owl research for the Northwest. Okay, the research that we're doing right now, there, there are several different facets of that research. One is we are looking at the, at the prey populations that the owl feed upon because we think that the prey uh, the abundance of the prey may influence where the owls forage at and where they live at. Another part of our research is a, a demographic study. Basically, the idea there is to get to, to, to look at, at how these populations turn over, to determine how long the adults live, to determine um, how, how many young they produce per year, and, and to determine uh, uh, the, the site attachment of the pairs to, to look at, you know, whether they stay at the same site year after year. Um, another part of our study is a radio telemetry study in which we're looking at that 
how the owls use their environment. We put transmitters on, on the owls uh, and then follow them. I think we have enough information now, uh, especially for t particular aspects of the owl biology, to make some, some very definite management plans. Um, I think the idea that uh, we need five more years of research, we were saying that five years ago. And my concern still is that we'll continue to do research, but until we start making some management decisions on the research that we've done, uh, we're, we're really not gaining, gaining any ground and, and losing options for the future. It seems to me uh, an issue that we must, first of all, if we're going to provide for habitat for the spotted owl, we must have the research necessary uh, to make sure that the freckle-faced logger is not out of work uh, while we're uh, discussing the issue of the spotted owl. Uh, Oregon's number one industry is timber. We're going to shut it down unless something occurs. Another issue that figures into the equation of the lack of timber supply and Oregon mills closing is log exports. Foreign buyers are offering big money for logs. It is illegal at the present time to export logs cut on federal lands, but state and private timber can be exported in an essentially unprocessed form. Federal timber is being sold off at below cost while state and private timber is bringing top dollar on the international export market. The small mills can't afford to compete for exportable timber, so they are limited to milling federal sales Large corporations, such as Weyerhaeuser, are exporting the timber from their own lands, as well as buying federal timber to run their mills. This, combined with the sales halted through the courts, has increased competition for federal timber to an unbearable level for many lumber companies. As a result, mill closures continue to be the frequent specter in the economy of the Northwest. Seventy-five thousand jobs in Oregon are directly involved in the timber industry. This includes loggers, truckers, and mill workers. On public land, the logging process starts when a timber sale is put up for bid. The mills will make a bid if the timber in the sale fits their equipment. The mill that wins the bid then hires a timber cutter, like Sap Brothers Logging Company in Alsea, Oregon, to log the unit. The timber cutters move in. Uh, sometimes the mills have their own and sometimes the logger um, has his own. But the timber cutters go in, start at the bottom of the unit and uh, work their way up, cutting the trees and bucking them into segments that can be handled on the landing. Um, the yarders, as soon as the, the strips of timber and the whole unit is prepared, um, the yarder goes in and sets up and uh, starts yarding them from the, from the unit into the landing, then they're loaded off to uh, on log trucks and sent to the mill. And, uh, that's basically what it is, not real glamorous. Logging has been a traditional trade in the Pacific Northwest. Today it is changing with the times. Timber harvest is no longer a strip and go process. Loggers are required to leave parts of the forest intact to protect watersheds, to prevent erosion, and to provide wildlife habitat. While it is less economical, wildlife populations such as the bald eagle and the red-headed woodpecker have benefited from the program. In terms of our mill, we're a stud mill, and that means two by fours. Um, the logs come into the log yard. They're run to, through what's called a debarker, which removes the bark off of the log. Then the log goes through a series of chop saws which, which cut it into the lengths <clears throat> that we want our lumber cut into. Then from there it travels down a chain to a, we have two saws. One is called a head rig and one is called a quad where they're cut into cants, cants being pieces of the log squared off on the sides. <clears throat> The process is continued through the horizontal resaw for thickness and into the edger which turns it into rough lumber. The lumber is kilned, run through a planing mill, trimmed up, and it's ready for sale. Byproducts are conserved and sold, bark for briquettes and bark dust, 
and chips for paper manufacture. Every part of the log is used. The difference between forestry and mining is the fact that our, the product that we are working for is a renewable resource. There are two forms of reforestation. In natural reforestation, trees that remain on the log site eventually reseed the area. This can take anywhere from two years to 30 years. The advantage of this method is that the trees from the seeds are already adapted to the elevation, climate, and soil of the area. In artificial reforestation, the site is replanted by hand with seedlings from a nursery. The advantage of this method is that no time is lost getting the land back into production, but nursery seedlings may have a harder time adapting to the area than natural seedlings would, being more likely to have problems with disease and climate conditions. No, you have to nurture it, just like you have a, if you have a garden, uh, you have to go out there every day and remove weeds and uh, uh, do thinning and uh, all the other necessary prudent things that a farmer has to do to maintain uh, his crop. We see the forest as much more than a tree farm. We see it as trees, trees to be harvested, but we also see it as habitat for wildlife species and recreational locations for ourselves. What is the balance between the economy and the environment for the future management of forest land? How do we know if we're meeting the balance? What do the management plans mean? How can they affect people like you and me? What alternatives are there to the current crisis? Our forests mean many things to many people. The Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, by law, are stuck in the middle. Both government agencies are charged with managing the forest in the public interest. Since the forests are public land, everyone gets a say in how they're used. Wildlife, recreation, and forest products industries all compete for their slice of the pie in the multiple use concept. Government agencies do their best to serve all competing interests, from spotted owls to timber harvest. Multiple use is used as a tool by all sides to make arguments for and against intensive management and preserving spotted owl habitat. The analyses that have been done on, on the the uh, management plan that's currently being implemented by the Forest Service and BLM suggests that the chances of that, of that uh, uh, plan working are very slim. Uh, there's a high probability that the population will eventually go extinct. There's no question that the philosophy of preservation is at odds with the, the current statutory framework for management of public lands, which is a multiple use framework that that requires the agencies managing the lands to balance all the competing interests and, and to serve all the competing interests. Uh, I think ultimately the goal of the movement is to change the legal framework and to, uh, to have the laws call for preservation as the, as the primary goal. We're concerned with what the, the receipts are off the forest and they will demand then so much amount of timber to be cut to get so much receipts for the year. When the head of the Forest Service comes out here to visit, he usually brings someone from the Office of Management and Budget with him, as if that's the most important type of person to be bringing when you're coming out to look at what the natural resource that he's managing out here in Oregon is. All those services without ONC timber receipts are going to be drastically cut back at a time when they're going to be most needed. Mental health, health care, all those kind of things. Um, our county commissioner Hank Henry, I talked to him last week. This year's budget from ONC timber receipts, $17 million. The revenue expected from property taxes, half a million dollars. So what does that tell you if those go away? So everything of what you hear, if, if, you, if you say it often enough, it becomes fact. And it's a very true statement, and I think that the preservationists have said things long enough to where people are believing them. Instead of uh, the, the industry saying, well, this is bullshit, and we shouldn't say it's bullshit, they've been saying, well, we've got the, uh, the Forest Service on our side, we've got uh, you know, the revenues are speaking for themselves, we've got all this common sense and common knowledge, we're in a tree growing area, we're growing trees, we're doing a good job. Instead of people realizing that, they're saying, geez, now wait a minute. 
What happens if the jobs dry up? What will happen to the people? What if your job were jeopardized by the current timber industry crisis? What would you do? I'd probably be looking for another job. I mean, I, I would have to, uh, I'd still be very concerned about the environment. It's too, I, I can't, you know, I can't do it. You know what I mean? I know that, uh, you know, I think it's important for people to look at their jobs and, and uh, I think the Doonesbury thing has been great this past week or two. I don't know if you've seen that. It's this perfect, I think it's a dilemma of, that we face a lot. Maybe it's a dilemma of the 80s or the 90s or the 70s, who knows? Maybe, I guess it's probably always a dilemma, but it's been about whether this guy is going to do an ad campaign for getting teenagers to smoke cigarettes, you know? And uh, he basically goes in, he thinks about it, he keeps having, you know, bad dreams and all these things about it. So he finally goes in and he's talking to the secretary and he says, how I'm going to tell the guy I'm not going to do this campaign. It's just not worth it to me. And she says, well, you could lose your job. You know, he says, yeah, that's true. He said, and, uh, and we really do need a new washer and dryer at home. And the secretary says, yeah, I'd go for the washer and dryer if I were you. And I mean, I think this is the, what you're asking me, you know. If I had that job, would I go for, maybe it isn't even a washer and dryer. But it's something like that, you know. Would I go for that or some socially and environmentally intelligent choice? Most people have a home and a, a family and a yard. And they like to take vacations if they can. A lot of them can't afford to. It's, uh, they're just normal people trying to make a living. I think many of them will move away to try and find jobs elsewhere because they're not going to be able to find jobs in the timber industry. If we, if we can't provide them, um, a lot of other mills aren't going to be able to provide them either. Um, some of them will lose their houses. Their children won't be able to attend the schools they've been going to for all their lives. Um, they may lose their cars. And we have dozens and dozens of companies that do not own any private timber lands at all and are entirely dependent on federal timber. Those without fee timber are most uh, vulnerable to interruptions in their federal timber supply and, and those companies and their workers are the ones that are most likely to be adversely affected by the continuation of the, of the uh, court imposed restrictions on timber supply. But mainly it's that they cut too much timber. And all of the private companies have pretty much liquidated 90 to 100 percent of their timber and are in a situation of having trees only halfway there. That doesn't sound like sustainable uh, management. And again, the, for the forests, as we've talked about before, are multiple use. They're not an extension of that tree farm. If predictions were made as if that forest was an extension of the tree farm, those were poor predictions not by environmentalists, but by timber industry executives who made those decisions. Uh, what's been lacking in the Spotted Owl controversy has been creative energy to accommodate both owls and jobs. And my opinion is that there's a lot more creativity available to solve the problem for both the owl and the people of Oregon uh, so that we can accommodate uh, these competing interests. The earth heals itself. I do believe in the great power of the earth to heal itself. I mean, it's, we can look at it and it may go over the edge. I mean, you know, but we don't even have, need to talk catastrophe to realize that it, it heals much slower than how we want to use it. We need to slow down the pace with which we use the environment because it can't keep pace with us. Every time I see a, another special on TV about the, the eradication of the tropical rainforests. And, and I mean, we here in the United States tend to look at these third world countries and say, oh, look what they're doing to their rainforests. It's just terrible. They're wiping out species right and left. And yet we have a very similar problem here, and we can't deal with it either. On the other hand, I don't think that you can just take away all the timber supply and just say, okay, that's it. Stop now, immediately. 
And all you guys, gee, that's really too bad. It's been nice having you around, and we really appreciate what you've done for our state. We ap appreciate what your employees have done in terms of um, community service and civic service and belong to our churches and clubs and stuff, and that's really great, but it's over now. See you later. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that a mere handful of preservationists preaching the gospel of preservationism with a missionary zeal should have absolute control of the natural resources in our nation. I think people speak with emotion a lot of times and when it affects their their uh, monthly income and uh, they've got m more bills than what they can pay for. I think uh, they speak with emotion and it's uh, probably not the right way to do it but I can understand why people might uh, support those things. Uh, it's, it's a frustrating feeling to be controlled and uh, I think uh, that's the way a lot of those people feel. So I don't have a bumper sticker on my car. Fallen trees, broken promises. What is the effect of modern civilization on the natural world? Have we cut too much timber? Will the owl disappear? What is the future for the industry that depends on this important natural resource? Unanswered questions that remain a source of confusion and fear for both the researchers who see a falling population of owls and for the workers whose jobs may be cut tomorrow. We face a dilemma that we'll have to resolve. Our demands for paper, lumber, and other wood products continue to increase. But our forests only have so much to give. They're like a savings account. We should live off the interest while conserving the principle. That is sustainable management. Management based on unlimited supply will lead to shortages, lost jobs, and environmental problems with unpredictable consequences. But at the right level, there's no reason why the timber industry shouldn't continue to provide jobs, products, and money to our communities as it traditionally has. There is a way out of this crisis, and it's up to us to find it, together. It's been five months since this documentary was shot, and a lot has happened with this issue since then. In June, Oregon voters passed a state moratorium on the exporting of logs from state forest lands. Private log exports from Oregon are still legal, though. Last year, Oregon's private log exports totaled over $4 billion. During the last eight months, the Bush administration was considering using federal timber exports to help balance the national budget. This plan could have had a severe impact both on the timber industry and on the environment. The Bush administration felt that log export revenue could be a simple way to take a bite out of the national debt. However, Northwest congressmen worked to show the Bush administration that from a purely financial standpoint, the plan would have actually lost the government money. The lost tax revenue from timber industry unemployment added up in a year to more than the actual income federal log exports could raise. Oregon congressmen argued that lost jobs would decimate the no Northwest's economy. Increased cutting would do irreparable damage to the environment as well. Thanks to Oregon congressmen, Bush administration plans have been shelved. Northwest congressmen also played a key role this summer in developing compromise legislation, which purportedly would bring the current spotted owl crisis to a halt. On Monday, President Bush signed this legislation into law. So when we come back, we'll have more on the compromise, and I'll be joined by two guests to debate the pros and cons of this federal legislation. In the last week of September, a joint House and Senate conference committee hammered out compromise legislation to deal with old growth forests in Oregon and Washington. In tense negotiation, both branches of Congress agreed on the severity of the problem and a temporary solution for it. The old growth and spotted owl debate is no longer merely a local to cut or not to cut issue. Congress made it plain this summer that it would be the new voice in this issue and that from now on this is a national problem with the national solutions. Forests in the Northwest are finally seen as a significant resource and the protection of them a priority. For some time, federal lawmakers have been searching for a temporary solution to the current spotted owl crisis. 
If nothing was done, there was a chance that thousands of timber industry workers would lose their jobs in mass layoffs due to a tight timber supply. For a number of years, environmental groups have been exercising their legal right to contest timber sales on Northwest federal lands. Because of the controversy over the cutting of old forests, a significant amount of the federal timber sale planned for both the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service has been held up in court. There are only two outs in this stalemate. One comes from the Fish and Wildlife Service, the other from federal Congress. The Fish and Wildlife Service is currently debating whether or not the spotted owl is endangered and if it should be declared so. That decision could take some time. As a result, both sides have been battling in court, creating a stalemate over the issue. The only other out which could have presented itself did. Congress this summer debated and passed two different versions of temporary legislation to compromise the two opposing sides, while the Fish and Wildlife Service makes up its mind on the spotted owl status. Both bills were compromised into one, and the current outcome of them seems to be an adequate temporary solution. The duration of the compromise is 12 months. After that time, unless the Department of Fish and Wildlife reaches a decision, things would go back to the way they were unless Congress extends the settlement. In principle, there are four main areas which the bill covers. The total cut in the forest, fragmentation of old growth stands, court challenges to the federal timber sales, and the release of half of the nearly two billion board feet of forest locked up in current lawsuits. As long as both sides agreed in principle to this compromise, it would have gone into effect immediately upon the passage of the latest $11 billion federal appropriations bill. Specifics of the compromise bill are sketchy, but those which have been released seem to meet at least some of the needs of both sides. For the next 12 months, federal timber sales would be set at 9.6 billion board feet, down about 1 billion board feet from current levels. The Forest Service and BLM would be required to cease fragmentation of old growth stands. This is to help the ecological system as well as protecting spotted owl habitat. Court challenges under the compromise would be limited. Only appeals to individual sales will be allowed, and those appeals must be lodged within 15 days of the sale offering. The courts would only have 45 days in which to make a decision. The sale would be blocked until the court rules. Roughly half of the two billion board feet in sales currently tied up in federal court would be released. Lawmakers stress that while this is a temporary solution, a more permanent decision needs to be created. They also warn that while this compromise will prevent widespread layoffs, there will still be some smaller, focused ones in some areas. Although the compromise seems to meet the needs of both opposing parties, neither side seems completely happy with the legislation. This rift over the compromise seems to threaten the atmosphere of reconciliation achieved in late September. If an agreement cannot be reached on the compromise, time and energy for all parties may have been wasted in preparing it. We're back on Oregon Diary. I'm Brian Bushlack, and I'm joined by two guests to discuss this compromise on the Spotted Owl. Kent Kelly joins us. He's the director of the Sayusla Timber Operators Association. And via phone, Art Farley, a representative from the Lane County Audubon Society. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. First, I'd like to ask you, Kent, uh, over the next 12 months, uh, timber sales in the region will be cut about 1 billion board feet below the current levels. And what I'm wondering is what kind of an effect will this have on the local area? Well, as far as the local area, I'm sure we'll have some impacts at this point in time. We're just trying to get the, the sale level uh, reestablished and running again. We've been at almost six months now without uh, much significant happening on the federal front as far as timber sales being offered, especially on the Sayus Law National Forest. Uh, and so at this point in time, we're just trying to gear ourselves up to the standpoint of, of attempting to run through this winter uh, and basically work out the situation as best as we can mm -hmm. come spring and summer. Now, Art, the uh, figure that we have on uh, the amount of timber that will be cut over the next 12 months uh, set about 9.6 billion board feet to down about, as we said, about a billion dollars from, uh, bill excuse me, a billion board feet from uh, current levels. Does that figure sit with you well? Well, it's, um, what we have to realize is actually the sale level this coming year will probably be about one and a half times the normal level. That is because this past year, as uh, the other guest has just indicated, Kent, that uh, sales have been quite slow this coming year, or this past year, I'm sorry. So this coming year, uh, sales are going to be actually quite high. 
Um, and uh, as he's saying, I think the timber industry and the Forest Service are going to have to quite gear up to be able to handle this actually added volume for the coming year. I see. So you're you're happy with happy with this uh, amount of timber that's going to be cut? Then? Well, well, I think what we could say is over the two years, the the sale level will be slightly lower than it has been over the last two or three year period. But that last two or three year period have been years when there's been almost record sale levels and sale levels which are not sustainable. And as we're looking toward the future, we still believe that the current uh, sales in this bill are not going to be sustainable levels and must come down more in the future. How much? How much do you think, Art? Well, that's hard to say. I would think if we really look at the future, uh, and that's what will be done this year, as we know this, this bill is just buying us a year to look forward and try to come up with a more long-term plan. But as we look to the future, I would think, you know, 30 to 30% 30 uh, reduction is probably what we're looking at if we really have serious intent to protect the ecological value in the forest. I see, Art. Now, Kent, do you believe that that's a, a logical and a fair amount? Well, I, I think it points to the, you know, it's centering on the difference of opinion and, and where it, it rests, and it's basically within the allocation process of what we're, uh, how we are going to, quote, design our forests. Uh, for instance, on the, within the national forests, uh, already we're looking at roughly an allocation which allows 50% of the land base to be harvested on. Uh, so we're not uh, at all willing to jump in and say, gosh, these levels are going to have to go down even further. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a very large part of the debate mm -hmm. in terms of you know, how much of this land base allocation does have to get set aside to preserve both the ecological, economic, and social mm -hmm. aspects that we uh, want our forest to provide us. I see. Now, another provision of the compromise includes the fragmentation of old growth uh, stands and then you cannot cut in uh, spotted owl habitat, uh, designated spotted owl habitat. Uh, there aren't a lot of old growth stands left in the area that, that you cut in, in the Al Sea area, I understand. So does this provision really have much of an effect or on you at all? Uh, to a large extent, it's going to depend on uh, the way the, the wording of the bill uh, is ecologically significant old growth. And old growth, basically, uh, we start as a first cut, as everyone is, I think, becoming aware of. That part of our problem is just gaining a common definition of what old growth would constitute old, constitutes old growth. Uh, that as we look at these different stands, it, it, it again, it, it will boil down to the definition that's, that's being used. Okay. Now, on the Sayus Law, I don't believe much exists. All right, let me jump in then, okay. uh, and I'll ask you, what is your definition, working definition of old growth stands? Uh, my working definition would, in essence, align quite closely to approximately 200 years okay. Okay. or older, okay. plus the structural characteristics that we normally attribute to uh, these stands, the, the large snags, the down logs, uh, basically a, a more decadent condition. I see. Art, uh, 200 years, is that good enough for old growth for you as well? Mm. Well, I think old growth is in a bit of misnomer as we're beginning to learn, but it really means really what the natural forest was all about. It's, it's the way the forest would be in its natural state, where we would surely have the dominant uh, trees in that grove will be upwards probably over 200 years old. But what we would find is not just 200-year-old trees. We would find young trees. Uh, we would find young trees coming up in the areas opened up by trees that had fallen down. Uh, and as was just indicated by Kent, we see indications of snag, down logs, trees that are going back into the soil and, and are there for the future forest to grow on. So old growth is really the natural forest in its in all of its stages, from the young trees coming up to the old trees. This seems to be the most uh, agreed upon provision of the compromise, as far as I can tell, that, that uh, you cannot cut in spotted owl habitat and uh, the old growth stands are going to have to be, uh, you're going to have to stop fragmenting them. Would you agree? Well, that sounds uh, a little strong, considering the other provision that you will be bringing up, which is that uh, 1.1 billion, billion board feet of timber currently under injunction are, are going to have to be released from those in court injunctions. Okay. And uh, if we're doing that, 
that is basically saying, yes, we are going to cut significant amount of old growth, and we are going to cut spotted owl habitat areas. And uh, that's what that other provision of this bill does guarantee, and it's probably the provision, obviously, of the bill that we have the, the least favor for. People have to realize that if we are going to release 1.1 billion board feet uh, from those injunctions, that translates into approximately 100,000 acres of ancient forest that must be sold this coming year off the forest. Okay, Art. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back, and Kent, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, is this third provision that we know of, the 15 days to file a challenge on a timber sale and 45 days for a court to rule on it. Now, in reading this, it seems that this is just a scaled-down version of what's been going on for the past few years. Well, to a certain extent, I, I think the full intent is to get these disputes handled in a very accelerated and timely manner. Uh, one of the problems that we see as an industry is once these timber sales do get tied up in court, it can literally be years before there's an outcome that, uh, uh, which is one of the largest points of concern that we have is just, again, facing the same delays that we ended up seeing here uh, the last six, seven months. I see. Art, is 45 days enough time for a court to... Uh to rule on a, on a challenge? Well, it's uh, doubtful, but the bill has asked the court to expedite these cases and has also given the court the right to appoint a special master, someone that would just be handling these cases within the court system and would become familiar with them. Okay, so, so there's some chance it could happen. So what you're saying is it's not going to go through a bunch of other legal processes. There will be a special channel for these challenges. Yeah, at least the courts do have the right to set that up okay. and could make mm -hmm. that happen in these cases, which is hopeful. I think we all would like some certainty here and decisions to be made. So you think this is going to be a pretty speedy process and uh, no problems with it? Well, we'll have to see how it does get implemented. I think most of this bill is unclear how it's going to be implemented. It's a very complex situation and one that's supposed to occur today <laughs> and only lasts for a year. And it, it's one of those things that looks like it could take 20 years to set up. So it's not clear how it will come out. So we're taking it day by day then. Right. Uh, the provision you talked about earlier, Art, uh, one half of, or actually 1.1 billion board feet will be released. Uh, and the effect on the local area and the economy can't, uh, what, how, how will that, this affect you? Will you be putting people back to work? Uh, will, Things be starting to run uh, again? Or? Uh, that's what we're hoping. One of the problems that we certainly get into is just that once the Forest Service puts up a sale for auction does not mean that literally the next day logs start coming to the mill. Mm -hmm. If you've got roads to build, at this, especially at this period of time, uh, we'll be waiting until next summer to enter those sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the minimum, by the time you go through your normal contract channels, get your bid guarantees, get your uh, the whole hoorah that goes that's involved in, in uh, getting contracts awarded and uh, contracting established to do the cutting, the logging, the trucking, uh, it literally takes two to three months mm -hmm. from the bid date. I see. One thing I want to ask you, Art, now the spotted owl has been researched more than any other non-game animal that we know of in the world, and I find it kind of ironic that they can't tell yet whether this is an endangered species or not. Can you tell us why? Well, I think we're just finding, you know, the limits of science and our understanding of any complex life cycle of any species, which is, you know, one, they're out there, they're wild, they are difficult to find. How many there are is not clear. And, uh, and then, yeah, you're needing to find out how often do they breed? What is the likelihood of breeding to and how does that breeding success depend upon the environment in which they're living? And we've had such a rapid change in the environment in which they're living. Literally over the last 40 to 50 years, we've removed more than two-thirds of the habitat that they prefer. It's hard to tell what effect that has. Well, Art, I'm sure that you hope the spotted owl becomes an endangered species, but uh, what will happen if it doesn't? Well, I think that's the next step. There is the listing process, and then there's the implementation process, which then uh, comes into effect. 
And I think we're beginning to see what that implementation is going to look like. Some attempt to make sure that large tracts of old growth do remain, that we have adequate habitat areas preserved for the species, and uh, we merge that into the plans for managing the forest. I'll turn that question around to you now, Kent. What happens if the spotted owl is an endangered species? Well, if it becomes listed, uh, one of the first things that will have to happen uh, will be the U.S. Fish and Wildlife will end up devising what's called a recovery plan. At this point in time, and, and where I end up getting very confused on the whole matter, is that the agencies have been studying this for years. Uh, they have been working on interagency agreements between basically all agencies. And at what point in time do you, you basically call it good? Uh, I think as earlier in the program, we talked about it used to be 300 acres, then 1,000 acres, now it's 2,000 acres in the coast range. This bill provides 2,500 acres. It, it's basically at what point in time do you stop? Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, rate the compromise. I'll give it a 5. How about you, Art? <laughs> Well, five sounds like a good compromise. <laughs> <laughs> so we do agree on something. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Kent Kelly from uh, the director of the Sayusla Timber Operators Association and Art Farley, a representative from the Lane County Audubon Society. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Next week on Oregon Diary, epilepsy. How much do you really know about this disease? Were you aware that it is legal to discriminate against certain victims of epilepsy? And did you know that epilepsy is treatable but not curable? Well, if you didn't, you're not alone. Tune in next week to Oregon Diary and find out about the nameless disease, epilepsy. That's all the time we have for now. I'm Brian Bushlack. Thanks for joining us and good night.